All right, here we go. MC Search from the legendary group Third Base. I don't know if legendary is the right word, but we, we were a group at one point. Well, I just want to say this. Like, I consider you guys to be the first traditional white rappers of all time. Meaning that uh, I think the Beastie Boys came out before you guys, but I felt that that was kind of a fusion between punk rock and hip hop. Like when you guys came out, I felt that it was more of a purist kind of hip hop uh, aesthetic that you guys brought to the game. And, uh, you know, for me, um, you know, who was a white kid that was, you know, obsessed with hip hop culture, that was breakdancing and everything else like that, seeing you guys on TV, you know, seeing someone on TV that actually looked like me doing the culture that I, you know, that I loved, I think was a big, you know, a big influence on, on me and who I am today. And, you know, with Vlad TV being my career at this point, you know, so like when you see that the M&Ms and the MGKs and the Mac Millers and the G-Eazys, you really have to mention MC Search and Third Base as the originators of all that. No, I think, I think because of what we grew up with um, and what we listened to, for sure. I mean, you know, um, Yao and uh, may he rest in peace and, and uh, you know, and Adam and uh, Mike, you know, they came from, uh, you know, a punk rock band with um, David Skilkin, may he rest in peace, you know, the young and the useless. And, you know, they were doing their thing and then they kind of transitioned over, you know, with Cookie Puss and all of that. But, you know, you know, I can't speak for Pete, but I can certainly speak for me that, you know, I came up in a much more traditional understanding of what the culture was, listening to like cassette tapes of like Kango Crew and cassette tapes of, you know, Special K and, and you know, um, Albino Twins out of Queens and like, you know, just cassette tapes after cassette tape after cassette tape of things that, you know, me and my boys were listening to. So certainly it was traditional. I, I will say though that I think that it's unfair to say that, you know, the GEZs and the MGKs and all of that, I, th I think that's bullshit because I think they were not motivated by third base. I don't think they were motivated by us at all. I think they were motivated by the things that were important in their communities. You know, Eminem had proof, Eminem had, you know, the, the hip hop shop, Eminem had Big Daddy Kane, Eminem, you know, he was, he was much more motivated by the true artists. And I think that that kind of propels, I think MGK was more motivated and more influenced by Bone Thugs, by, you know, the things he was listening to, the same thing Jeezy. I mean, Jeezy was probably more influenced by Mac Dre, may he rest in peace, and E-40, than he ever was by third base. So I, I don't necessarily agree with that at this point uh, in hip hop. I think that there has been such a growth of the culture um, and because it's completely regionalized that these kids don't have to look to a, a rap group that happened to be white from 30 years ago as a, as a motivating factor. I feel you, and I see what you're saying, but it's a, it's a snowball effect. You know, in order for one to happen, something else had to happen first, and so forth. And like I said, you guys were the first ones to really come out and do what I consider traditional hip hop, you know, on MT, you know, MTV Raps, on Def Jam, you know, incorporating the dancing and everything else like that. And like I said, for me, who's, you know, roughly, you know, your age range, it was a big influence. On no, and, and I, you know, and that I respect, like for you, that I get, like, you know, for you and me and dudes that are, you know, in that age range, you know, 45 to 55 and above, like, yeah, that, that totally makes sense because there was no one who looked like us doing what we were doing. Certainly there was no, you know, white boys with a high top fade in 1989, you know what I'm saying? There was no white rappers wearing, you know, you know, Armani suits, Hugo Boss custom made suits, you know, with a cigar in their mouth. Like, there, you know, there was no Jamaican DJs who were jumping over their turntables. You know what I'm saying? Like, certainly that I can respect. But to say that there was a snowball effect, let's put it like this. When you interviewed Arsenio Hall and you said that Vanilla Ice was more significant because he had a bigger record than third base, 
right? That we didn't have a succession of hits. That to me is more impactful in terms of the snowball effect, right? Like a lot of people see, see us as these one hit wonders. Like they see us in a larger scope of things as, you know, we came, we saw, we put out a record and then we were done. And I think that maybe over time, people were able to look back and say, wow, you know what? You know, they did XYZ or Search did XYZ and all of that. But I think what you said to Arsenio when you were interviewing him, you know, three years ago, I think was pretty succinct. I think that, you know, we were looked at as one hit wonders. And that's okay. Like, I don't have an issue with that. I think that in the long standing of it, there are people that respect the aesthetic enough that they say, okay, you know, search and third base were important during blank. And then we kind of did not continue that. We certainly didn't have the longevity that Eminem has had and the impact he has had. We certainly haven't had even the impact that Action Bronson has had on the culture. We certainly haven't had the impact that G-Eazy has had on the culture. We were very succinct and timely for our moment. We were very important for a collective of people that were growing up in the culture. Um, but then we kind of went away. And, you know, whatever my solo record was and whatever that was or whatever, you know, I did after that, I, I, again, I, when, I, when I see that interview that you did with Arsenio and I, and I think about it, I think it would be incredibly egotistical to say, oh yeah, blah, 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 you know, and I, I, you know, for me, I just feel like it's bullshit. Like, I think it's just like, yo, we need to stop lament, you know, lamenting over these whole, like, oh, we were X 30 years ago. Like, the dude who's recording me, he doesn't know anything about that. And that's okay, like, he can go back, but, you know, little Zan and whatever he's listening to is 10 times more important than anything I did. And that's okay. You know what I mean? Like, history is for us to kind of hand down and say, you know, the G-Easy of today or the little Zan of today or whatever is the equivalent of what I listen to. And we don't have to uh, critique their music versus our music. But I think to say that it was a snowball, again, I, I think it might be, I think it's ODing a little bit. I think that the culture snowballed. And whether it was Third Base or Vanilla Ice or Hammer or Hyro or Snoop and Dre, you know, I think the culture snowballed. And I think that the opportunities as the culture expanded gave all of these artists the opportunity. And, I, and again, I, you know, I, Look, I'm just one person and I had just one experience and that's my experience, but I just, I think that, you know, to say that and, and to think that is just, I think it's like ODing at this point. And no disrespect to you and I get, like, I understand where you're coming from and I mm -hmm. appreciate it because that's your memories and that's what you hold on to and that's where you come from and that's where I come from. So yeah, so for me, Kane, G-Rap, DJ Polo, Paul C, may he rest in peace, Super Lover C, Casanova, Rudd, Stetsa Sonic, like all of those artists have Brand Nubian even, like Don Barron, like I was just talking to Don Barron yesterday, like those guys have such importance in my life, but I would never look at like Alex A-Game who got that hot shit with Tory Lanez right now and say, oh, if he doesn't pay homage to Don Barron, fuck Alex A-Game. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yo, you know, like, mm -hmm. it just, the snowball is more about the culture having these great opportunities to expand and widen the streaming aspect, the, the, the ability to, to see the music, opposed to, oh, well, if we don't pay homage, then, you know, Oh, fuck all that. That's bullshit. And, that, and that's really ego shit. That's really ego shit. We have to look at the progression of this. You know, Vlad, you know, I remember when you were like, you know, when we were just talking about behind the scenes, when you were coming up and you were breaking bread with Justo, may he rest in peace, and you were chasing dudes like, yo, get on my mixtape, get on, you know, but you were proving yourself as a dope DJ. And you were proving yourself as someone who cared and loved about the culture. And then you expanded your touch and your reach and seeing the way the internet was growing, seeing the way that communication was growing, seeing the way the content was growing. And you kind of forged your way in that. 
You know what I'm saying? But for, and again, it's no knock on anybody, but for you to kind of say, well, you know, is a snowball effect from like video music box. Like, it's different. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, and I just interviewed uh, Ralph McDaniels also. <laughs> I would <laughs> not have, and, and I can honestly say this, I, I know I would not have a career if it wasn't for Ralph and the vid kid. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, they, they, without question, like those guys put in work for third base that, you know, I love that guy to death. Yep. Shout out to Ralph McDaniels. You know, this is our first time actually sitting down, so I kind of want to go through the history of MC Search. Sure. So you you actually were born and raised in an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood. I was. I wasn't Orthodox myself, but I was raised in a Orthodox neighborhood. I was conservative. Aha. Uh -huh. Not even okay, really so conservadox, but really conservative. Okay, but not, not Hasidic. Oh, hell no. No, okay. no, no. That was never going to go down in my house. Like, we kept kosher. You know, my mom and dad kept kosher. It was, you know, it was all of that. But, like, even in my own neighborhood, I wasn't, like, really looked at as being Jewish enough. Like, you know, there was still things that, like, people would do that were a violation. Like, Orthodox people would knock on our door after sundown and say, can Michael come turn off our stove? which is halacha, which is like a crazy disrespect. To ask another Jew to break Sabbath because you don't see them as being Jewish enough. Mm. It's, it's crazy foul. But, you know, I didn't know it at the time. My mom was like, yeah, go, you know, the Levinsons need their fucking stove turned off. Go turn off their stove. Like, it didn't mean shit to them. You know, I didn't yeah. know until later, like, that was lush and hara. Like, that's crazy. But, you yeah. know, but no, I wasn't like, I wasn't raised Orthodox. Okay. So... At what point, as a kid, and being like a hip hop fan and being in New York, did you say, okay, I'm going to actually start taking this rap thing seriously and actually start writing down my rhymes and so forth? So, seventh grade, um, a lot of my homeboys went from using their government names to becoming, you know, these Fapacentas. You know, my man who had a government name became Mathematics and another one became Lord Duquan. And you know what I'm saying? So like there was this cultural change and shift of my boys when they were 13, 14 years old, you know. And um, all of a sudden we started to listen to these cassette tapes that were like third and fourth generation cassette tapes of the park jams that were going on in Hollis, in Prospect Park. And in, in Harlem, and we would hear these groups, like I said, Kango Crew, and we would hear, you know, um, Treacherous Three, and we would hear Busy B, and, you know, we were hearing all these dudes, and it was really grainy, and it was like really, you know, kind of hard to hear, and, you know, we were drinking, you know, Blackberry Brandy, and you know what I'm saying, like, we were just chilling in the park, like, listening, and it became this thing that we did because we could. You know what I'm saying? Like there was no restriction on it. Like homeboys were passing out tapes. It, was, it wasn't commerce. It was just like you didn't have to pay for it. Like your homeboy's uncle or your brother was like, yo, you need to check this shit out. And it was this tape that got passed from like homeboy to homeboy. And it was fourth generation, fifth generation, sixth generation. And I remember there was this one group called Kango Crew. And they had all these like cool little skits. You know, Hillbilly Girl and um, Indian Girl. And like, like it was so funny. Like, they, I, I, those are the ones I remember because I was probably a horny little, like, 13-year-old. You know what I mean? So, like, I remember all the Kango crew, Hillbilly Girl. And, like, they were all getting at these girls with, you know. Um, so, it was cool. You know what I mean? Like, it was cool. It was, like, music to listen to. And... Um, I tried out for a school, you know, in New York, we have these things called public privates where you can try out for these schools. Um, and, you know, there were math specialty schools, science specialty schools and creative art specialty schools. One of them being music and art, which my mother actually went to, may she rest in peace, in like the 30s, 40s. So I told her, you know, I wanted to go there and try out because the last thing I wanted to do was go to Far Rock High School. Like I, I didn't really want to be local. 
you know, like I wanted to like expand my horizons a little bit. So I tried out for music and art, I got in. And the first day I get there in orientation, they send everybody down to the lunchroom. And when I go down to the lunchroom, I see these kids around the lunch table and they're beating on the tables and I'm hearing a dude beatbox and all of this. And then like, I just kind of walk over and I hear these voices that sound real familiar. And sure enough, it's these four dudes doing Hillbilly Girl. And I'm like, oh shit, like they know, they know the rhymes. Like I know the rhymes, like, oh, that's dope. Like, you know, they, you know, they, you know, this guy next to me named Steve Bosco, I said, yo, they, they know the lyrics like to the Kango crew. And he goes, white boy, that is the Kango crew. And I was like, I said, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Which one's Ricky D and which one's Dana Dane and which one's Lance Romance and which one's Omega? And he's pointing them out. And then another dude starts rhyming and his name is Jay Cool. And he, he's from a group called the Fresh 3 MCs. And then there's another dude rhyming, this kid Lord Taru from this Brooklyn crew that I knew called the Eternal Force. And like, it was bigger than life. You know what I mean? Like, like dudes that I had been listening to for two years on tapes are like right in front of me, banging out beats on a lunch table. You know what I mean? Like, it was incredible. Like, it was incredible. And then this dude was beatboxing who knew Ricky D and then his name was Doug. And like, you know, so, it, and then, you know, later it became Dougie Fresh and like, you know what I'm saying? So like, all my dudes from high school that I had been listening to in middle school literally went from high school to having the biggest records in New York, you know, because it became a business. You know, it became uh, an entity that went from fifth generation cassette tapes to actual pressed vinyl and labels getting you signed and, you know, and all of that. And uh, that's when it bit me. That's when I was like, wow, like, yo, if Ricky D can go do Lottie Dottie, like, you know, and he become a star and Danny Dane can do like Nightmares in the Night and like all of these street, you know, little things that they were doing were becoming records. Like, you know, you know, why can't I do it? So I started to pen like lyrics every day. You know, I wouldn't rhyme for anybody because there were no white boys that I was seeing rhyming except later on I saw this kid Vanilla B, um, AKA uh, Lord Scotch, who became Keo, Kiway K, um, Blake Latham, who was, as far as I know, for all intents and purpose, the first white rapper ever. Um, mm -hmm. And he kind of became my mentor. And, um, and I would follow him around like a puppy dog because he was from Brooklyn, he walked around with a loose side cane, you know, he had a Kango tilted, he had to match an orange Kango with the orange like Lacoste and like he was fly. So like I would follow him around like a puppy dog because I was like from Far Rockaway. So, you know, what the fuck was Far Rockaway? Like these dudes are from Brooklyn, you know what I mean? Like I'm from fucking Far Rockaway. Uh, and, uh, and I would just write rhymes. Like I would just write rhymes every day. I would just like see something and I'd be like, all right, boom, 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 boom. But I didn't really think about putting them out. And, uh, at the end of high school, like I, uh, I told my mom, like, I'm going to make this move to try to become an artist. So it's kind of how it went down. And then when did you hook up with, uh, Pete Nice? <sighs> um... So I had put out two independent singles uh, in New York. And the second one was with a female beatbox called K-Love. And uh, K-Love was managed by my DJ, who was this guy, Grand Wizard Tony D. And they had a huge record in New York called Inspector Gadget, the Bad Boys. They were called the Bad Boys. And they had a record called uh, Inspector Gadget. And then they had a little street record that was really dope called Veronica. Dope. Dope records, and and Tony D managed me, and he managed K Love, and um, he kept telling me about this dude that he knew from Brooklyn named Lamumba Carson. May he rest in peace. And Lamumba was managing this kid out of Queens, who was also a white rapper named Pete Nice. And I was hanging out a lot with like Clark Kent at the time. Like I'd be at Clark's house. And like, you know, having him DJ and we'd be just talking and like, you know, his mom would be making me food and like, you know, like that was like was my dude. Still to this day, that's my dude. And um, then he started telling me about this dude that he knew, you know, named Pete Nice. Um, I was like, whatever. And then Blake outside the Latin Quarter introduced me to him one time. But I was like, you know, whatever, like I'm, you know, 
whatever. Like, okay, cool. Nice to meet you. So I was working on my demo um, for Rush. I was signed. Lior had signed me to Rush Management. I was working on my demo. And um, me and uh, Sam Sever, the producer, had already made like four songs. And this guy from A&M Records named Steve Robowski, who had already done the Def Jam deal at uh, CBS at the time, um, had moved over to A&M and he was trying to sign a, a rapper for A&M. And um, Lior had sent him my tape. He was like, yo, this kid is kind of fresh. And it was down to me and this dude Raheem out of Houston, Texas. I'll never forget this. So he was coming to see me the next day and I was going to play like three or four of my, my, my songs on my demo. But there was something about him like, I mean, I liked them because I had made them. They were like, you know, but I, they didn't feel right. Like there was something about them that like didn't feel right. But I was like, you know, fuck it. If everybody else likes it, it's cool. Like whatever. But it didn't like feel right to me. Like I was like, eh. But I was like going with it. You know what I'm saying? Like the bottom line is get a deal, get a deal, get a deal, get a deal. Like you'll figure it out later. You know what I'm saying? So Sam Sever calls me and he's like, yo, you need to come to the crib. And I'm like, okay, why? He's like, well, I know we're going to do this meeting with A&M and this dude Steve, but Dante Ross called me last night, and um, I guess this dude Pete Nice was in the studio, and he got stood up. Like, he had bought his own studio time, and everybody that was supposed to look out for him stood him up, and he called Dante, and he had me come in and, like, help him with his demo, and he's like, yo, this shit is hard. Like, this shit is really hard, you should hear it. And then Sam kinda lied to me, but it's okay, but he kinda lied to me. And he was like, and he's also signed to Rush, so he's direct competition for you, so we should probably, instead of, you know, dealing with this, we should maybe think about, like, coming together. And I'm like, no. Like, why would I think about getting together with anybody? I'm like five minutes from having my own deal. You know, it's not going to happen. We've just spent like three months. Lior's put up all this money. Like, I'm not just going to get in a new group. He's like, nah, you need, you, need to, you need to come listen to this. I said, all right. I go to Canal Street um, where uh, Sam's apartment was. I go in and there's this dude, Pete, that I know. Like, I've met him a hundred times. So I was like, oh, Pete Nice. And he's like, yeah. And he plays me the demo that they made that, that night, and it was the beat from Words of Wisdom. And everything right there just clicked. Like, in my head, like every, and I just started writing. And as soon as I heard Pete say, hard as hard as Chinese arithmetic, oh, my God, I'm not a heretic, I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> motor, motor lyrics, second verse, third verse. We go right to Chung King, like, literally that moment. We get into the studio because Lior basically giving us an open door, we knock out words of wisdom. We knock out another song. Like, flow is just automatic. So the next day, Steve Robowski meets us at um, Chung King. And um, he comes to meet me. He's talking to me. And Pete's here and Sam's here. And he's like, yeah, you know, Search, it's like, you know, I, I like you, but there's this kid in Houston named Raheem, like I really like him, like why should we sign you over Raheem? And I'm like, well, first of all, it's not MC Search anymore, it's a group, this is my partners, we're called Three the Hard Way, I'm gonna play you some new songs. And I played them Words of Wisdom and we played them another song which was wound up being, becoming Triple Stage Darkness. And um, he, you know, he's cool, like he's nodding his head. And then he said something kind of like we didn't really catch, he was like, well, I don't really get the group thing, but you know, we'll we'll talk. And I'm like, cool. So we go <laughs> to work in, in the studio, because we're already there. So like, fuck it, we're gonna keep working on demos and kind of figure out this three to hard way thing. And Lior calls the studio and he starts screaming on me, get the fuck out the studio. You just ruined a deal. The fuck is wrong with you? I spent all this money and you fucking go and form a group at the last minute. You're fucking, you're done. I quit. Get the fuck out of the studio. Like, 
So I, you know, whatever, I blew this deal. And it was so funny because Lior, knowing that he was, that he could lean on this a little bit, called my mom on some Jewish guilt shit. Called my mom and was like, talk to Michael. He's ruining his career. Like he has a record deal. He's formed this group in the last minute. I don't know what's going on. Talk to him. And my mother, I get home and she's like, well, why can't it just be MC Search and this Peter person could be your hype man? You know, I know that there's a hype man. Like I see like Public Enemy has this flavor guy who's a, why can't, I'm like, no, that's, mom, it's not the way it works. Like, you know, we're a group. You know? Anyway, so that's how I formed a group with Pete and Sam. Okay, and that group went from three the hard way to third base. Right, because Universal um, Pictures wouldn't give us the rights to the Jim Kelly Three to Hard Way uh -huh. uh, name of the movie. Third base, third base is a better name, though, to be honest. Well, it, you know, it's funny. There's a skit on the Cactus album that, you know, Pete used to like to record people on the low. So right, between, right before Gas Face, there's a skit that Pete privately recorded Russell when we were telling him the name of the group. And we're trying to convince him that we want to go with either three blind mics or three hard dicks. And then we drop third base as the third option. And he's like, yeah, no, three hard dicks is good too, but third, third base. And then the beat comes in for gas face. So, yep. yeah, I, 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 always, I always loved that name. I mean, but there were things about that name that annoyed me because... People would always misspell it in the beginning, B-A-S-E, and search would be S-E-A-R-C-A, -E like, you know, and just little things, like, you know, but I was, I was really, because I spent a lot of time, like, writing for Houdini and all of that, like, the lyric that they said in Big Mouth, you can say what you want, but just spell my name right, like, that was, like, a real respect thing for me, like, if you couldn't figure out that my name didn't have an A in it, like, then you really weren't paying attention and how much did you really give a fuck about like, you know, so it's just like you can say what you want, spell my name right. So you guys get signed to Def Jam as third base. And uh, the first single was Step Into the AM. Mm -hmm. And I guess that song was meant for Eric B and Rakim? It was meant for Rakim, correct. It was meant for Rakim. Yeah, dope song. I mean, I remember when I first heard it. I mean, the beat and, and everything else like that was like, okay, this is this is a hit. I mean, in the hip hop world, it wasn't like a pop hit because you know there really weren't a lot of kind of hip hop pop hits at that time. There weren't any. There weren't any. Right there, you go. But in the hip hop world, I'm like, okay, this is this is dope. And you had the high top fade. You had the, the third base, you know, uh, shaved into the back. And, and I remember you started off the video because I went and rewatched it, you know, before our interview. And it's like you come in and, you know, with a hoodie and it just looks like a regular hip hop video. And then you turn around, it's a white kid and you go, it's the other man. So, so with, that, with that single, well, first of all, with writing the lyrics for Rakim, we, I got a call from Lior. He was managing us. And he basically was like, Look, Rakim's in a bit of a, he's got a bit of writer's block. I know you're cool with Eric B. Could you write some lyrics, maybe get him jump started? So Rakim, even to this day, to me, is the greatest MC of all time. Like, period. Um, so it was a tremendous honor to be asked to write anything for Rakim. To write a word for Rakim was, you know, let alone a song. So it was easy for me to get into his mind frame and think about, okay, how would I want him to kind of, you know, and how do I see him? And I saw him in my head with Supreme and with his crew and, you know, them stepping to the AM. I was like, oh, shit, they should, yeah, step into the AM. That's dope. That's dope. And then I, all of a sudden, it just I heard, ready in the intro, cue up the searchlight. Eric B's in center stage. I grabbed the first mic, projected my voice, this mic that I'm cuffing. You ain't my knuckle, a sucker, them stuffing. The word of rock him stands true, so no panicking. Man versus man, you freeze up like a mannequin. Petro, you like, like, and it just 
pouring out of me, just pouring out of me. One take, just pouring out of me. So the next day, I called Leo that night. I said, yo, I got a record. It's called Stabbing Today. <laughs> we go to Rush. It's noon. I'll never forget it. It's noon. Lior's on his, in his office on the second floor at 298 Elizabeth. I'm downstairs in the pit because there was this, all these different uh, desks. And we conference in Eric B. And Lior goes, Eric, I got your homeboy Search on the phone. Search wrote a song for Rakim. And he goes, Search, I'll turn it over to you. And I said, hey, Eric, um, Lior asked me to write something I did. It's called Step Into the AM. And I said, ready in the, and I hear click in the dial tone. <laughs> 30 seconds later, the receptionist, our homegirl Denise, uh, says, Lior, Eric B is online too. He wants to talk just to you. And then 30 seconds later, I hear Denise say, Lior told me to tell you search to wait, to stay here and wait. One o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock, 5.30. Finally, six o'clock. I'm sitting there six hours. I go upstairs, takes me upstairs, and Lior starts screaming on me. Yo, why didn't you tell me you had beef with Eric B? Why didn't you tell me that he can't stand you? And I'm like, yo, I don't know what you're talking about. Like me and Eric hung out in the Latin Quarter. Like I got one of the first copies of Eric B for president on white label. Like that's my man. Like I used to, we used to drive to Long Island together and you know, you know, like what he's like, oh no. Yo, you almost cost me a client. They were about to quit. Yada da da da. Eric's furious. But all I know from my side is that three weeks later, follow the leader was done. So I don't know if I was a motivating factor, not whatever, whatever the case may be, whatever it was, that second album got done and everything was done. But Eric B to this day hasn't talked to me, like won't speak to me. Okay, I, I've never been familiar with Rakim having someone else write his lyrics. I don't that, think it's ever. I don't think it's ever been ever something ever. Okay. Ever. I don't think yeah. anyone's ever written for. I mean, just the thought. You have to understand something from a fan perspective. Just the thought of writing one word for Rakim. Greatest moment in my career. Period. Greatest moment in my career. Just that someone would think that I might be good enough to write a lyric for the greatest MC of all time. I could have been shot in the head the next day and I would have had the greatest career of my life. Hmm. That somebody would trust me and trust me with that potential, you know, because he's still to me. And again, this is just me. He is the greatest MC of all time. And I ain't no joke is the most perfect rap record ever made beginning to end. I agree. I agree. Well, so I don't know if you agree. That. I think you're being nice. I'm sure you have your own personal favorite of all time. Well, but I don't know I mean, if I, I, ain't I think no joke you have, to, you have to put Rakim at the top of almost any list. Without in question. In terms of, you know, n not, not only in, you know, his body of work, but also at the time when he came out, nobody was doing anything like that at all. When I heard, I, I, and I remember being in the hood with my boys, and when we heard, you thought I was a donut, you tried to glaze me. I mean, I threw away at least four rap books. I was like, oh, all of this is bullshit. He, he is just literally taking the game to the next level. Thought I was a donut, you tried to glaze me. I mean, my head exploded. You know what I'm saying? Like... You scream, I'm lazy. You must be crazy. Thought I was a donut. You tried to glaze me. I mean, that was knocking on every block on every Martin Luther that I went to. And everybody said the same thing. It wasn't even a question that that line, just people who were l lyrically involved in the culture, 
threw away any rhymes that they wrote pre, pre that line. So for Lior to call me and think that I even was close to good enough to write a word for the God MC, like, Eric B. could have came and killed me with Supreme the next day. I would have had the best career in my life. So you guys dropped Step Into the AM, but on that same album was The Gas Face. Correct. And uh, at the end of The Gas Face, you guys diss MC Hammer. Correct. And you guys even had like this, like this giant hammer in the video with like Kazelle glasses on that you guys like slap over and stuff like that. I was at the time I was living in the Bay, and uh, you know Hammer was one of our heroes in the Bay. You know because I mean the world knew him for Can't Touch This, but you know the, the hip hop kids were fans before that. You know um, Turn This Mother Out, and you know and so forth. What was it about MC Hammer that made you guys actually diss him? in one of your singles like that so publicly? Well, for me, there was something private and then there was something public. So private, um, early on in my career, I was a valet and I used to do things for Houdini. I would write a lyric here and there, like I would help them with, you know, ca carrying their stuff, steaming their clothes. Like, you know, I was basically a roadie for Houdini. Um, I went out with them on a trip to the Bay Area. And people were talking about this guy, MC Hammer, MC Hammer, MC Hammer. And um, I heard he was a really good dancer. And I was really, you know, I prided myself on being a really good dancer as well. Like I could jump through my leg and all of that. So I get out to the Bay Area and people were telling me about this kid who worked for the Oakland A's, who was a, a ball boy who was selling records out his trunk. And, you know, basically following the two short, you know, kind of career path. We were at this event, this basketball event, and Hammer pulls up, he's got this beautiful Cadillac, and people are like giving him a shout out. And um, I just rolled up on him and I was like, yo, I heard, you know, I said, yo, my name's Search, I heard you're a good dancer, let's battle. That's, you know, New York mentality. Figuring that that translated anywhere. And he looks at me, he's like, yo, fuck you, and he drives off. So I'm like, Okay, whatever. So in the memory bank, goes in the memory bank, you know, whatever. Fast forward, and Hammer disses Run DMC and says that he wasn't hitting in New York, his videos dissing running them. And Joey and Jay, may he rest in peace, yo, that shit really bothered them. And it really bothered us. Like, how are you going to diss the dudes that gave you a lane? Like, you wouldn't even be on American Bandstand. Like, you know, at the time, there were very few lanes for hip-hop, but they were all opened by Run DMC. It was either Run DMC or LL Cool J. Your music didn't move those type of kids, right? So you ain't hitting in New York. So we took it personally. So Jay is the reason I even really got on. So like Jay was beyond just someone that I idolized because he was from Queens. Jay is, Jay was like a mentor, a father figure. Like Jay was, so when I was doing Gas Face, I told Jay, I was like, yo, we're gonna, we're gonna tell, we're gonna say, yo, Hammer gets a Gas Face. What do we think about Hammer? And Jay said to me, he goes, and when you do the video, we're all gonna be there. So we did, you know, we told Ralph McDaniels to do this hammer thing and all of that. And when we did that, Jam Master J was there, DMC was there, Run was there. You know, J was the one, D knocks the glasses off him, J knocks him down. And then we had one of our homeboys who looked like the two big MC to grab him and run him off, right? Ha ha ha. All good. And then, you know, Pete said the line that really pissed Hammer off about, you know, Cactus turned Hammer's mother out. Um, and that was the one that really, that really took him over, over the, over the, over the edge. But the whole genesis of it for me was twofold. One, he wouldn't battle me, which is petty, but I was, you know, 19 years old. Like, so in my, my mentality and how we looked at how we dealt with things in hip hop, you battle. That's not his culture. It's not where he comes from. And even if it is, what does he have to prove to me? And I understand this now, not I'm a fucking grown man, but 19, I'm full of piss and vinegar, and he's telling me, go fuck myself. Like, oh, fuck you. So when we did the gas face 
video, like, first of all, that record was piping hot in New York. We were like, that was like the hottest record in New York. So everybody came to the video. Kid and Play, Herbie Lovebug, Salt and Peppa, uh, Run DMC, you know, Shake, the, you know, Stretch, like all these people, like mad. Eric Sermon was in the video too. Eric Sermon, um, mm -hmm. Paris, um, well, EPMD. You know, yeah. uh, Gilbert Gottfried's in the video. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was like, it was a, a little bit of a movement, you know, for the city. So we felt like we owed it to run in them to hold them down the way they held me down. On the Cactus album, our album was called The Cactus. Hammer's album was called Turn This Mother Out. We had a song called The Cactus. Title song to the album. Last verse... Pete says something, and then the last line is, the cactus turned Hammer's mother out. And I went, there it is. Now that line, for any MC realized, people realized that we were saying that our album was better than his album. But it was a play on words and it was fucking dope. It was a fucking dope play on words. The cactus turned Hammer's mother out. The name of his album was Turn His Mother Out. So our album, we felt our album was better. Like, again, confrontation, battle. That's, like, where we come from in New York. It's standing up for your shit. He didn't take it that way. He took it extremely literal. We were doing a huge promotion in L.A. for the release of the Cactus album. Album party, performances. Local Fox 5 was doing a story. They had a show called The Reporters. They were following us around. Um, we were giving away a Jeep, a product of the environment Jeep on K-Day, which was the first 24-hour rap station in the, in the country. And it was our first trip to Los Angeles. I'd never been. Um, so we're all excited. And we're all getting on the plane. I got my girlfriend, now wife, Chantel, on the plane. And Pete has his girlfriend. And Daddy Rich has his girlfriend. And, you know, we're all just happy and excited. And we're going out there. And we're hearing all these cool things like, you know, people are just loving the album. And, you know, all sorts of cool things that we're hearing about, you know, our music kind of transcending over, you know, state lines. And the president of Def Jam at the time was a woman named Carmen Asher Swatson. She gets a call just as we get on the plane. And I believe they identified that the call was from Hammer's brother, Louis Burrell. And I don't, I can't prove that or not prove that, but that's what it came down to. Whoever was on the phone said, hey, is third base still coming to LA? And she said, yes. And the voice said, good, they're dead, and hung up the phone. So Carmen, being the sensible person, doesn't like just be like, oh, whatever. Calls Russell and says, hey, I think we might have a problem with third base in Los Angeles. I think I just got a death threat. So Lior had a dude who worked with him from Los Angeles named Big D. Um, and Big D was also the day-to-day -day, like security for Run DMC. So Lior calls Big D. And Big D says, well, the person we need to call is Eric B. Eric B will know. Eric B <laughs> calls Russell and goes, yeah, it's true. There's a hit. There's a hit. Uh, rolling 60 Crips, 30,000 members, $50,000. Dead. So Russell says to Eric B, well, how do we stop this? And Eric says, nah, you should just let it happen, and hangs up the phone. Russell, in some way, shape, or form, gets in touch with Mike Conception. And Mike confirms what's going on. But Mike says that he can control it, and that they shouldn't worry, because the only thing that will happen is he'll, they'll just break our legs. But we'll still be able to do TV from the waist up. <laughs> and uh, Russell says, well, listen, how do we, how do we protect them completely. And Mike says, well, I need two things. He goes, first of all, I got this record called We're All in the Same Gang, and I need some help kind of figuring out a label situation, so if you could help me with that. But the second thing is, tonight's the American Music Awards, and I want to sit next to Michael Jackson. Russell called Donnie Einer, who was the chairman of CBS, and said, I need your tickets for the American Music Awards. 
I got a guy who needs to sit next to Michael Jackson. Needless to say, they tell me the story. And in typical New York fashion, I'm like, this is all bullshit. This is bullshit. And I'm fighting with this dude, Uncle Mel, who's in, in, you know, who they brought in, in charge of our security, who wound up doing security for Dre and Easy, and like, you know, Uncle Mel became like the security guard in, in, in LA. And as they're arguing with us, this dude comes in, and this was his name, it wasn't even, his name was Pookie. And he was my conception's lieutenant. And he tells us he's here to stay by us the entire time. That Mike sent him, staying with us the entire time. And I said, oh, you're supposed to protect me? And I remember he had a short sleeve shirt and he had all these welts. And my wife just politely says, oh, you know, how did you get the keloids? He's like, he said, nah, love, these are bullets. So now I'm really thinking this dude's full of shit, right? So I'm like, all right, man. I said, look, I want to take my wife to Louis Vuitton at the Beverly Center. Like, and Uncle Mel's like, yo, you don't, and, and Pookie's like, no, 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 no. Let's, let's search want to go. We can, we, let's go. Go down the escalator. All these chicks start noticing me. They start rumbling. My swag is on a thousand. I'm starting to sign autographs, right? And I'm, you know, when, you know, you're around like people that want to meet you, you know, you're, you know, you got your head down, you're signing autographs. And I started to look up, and there's these dudes coming from south and west, you know, and they're just walking over, whatever. And I'm signing autographs, and I look up, and I'm signing autographs, and, and as they get closer, the dude over here, he pulls the rag up. Dude over here, he pulls the rag up. They start to spread the girls, and as they come up to me, Pookie whistles, Everything stops. He throws up some signs, whatever signs he throws up. And it's one dude right in front of me who's got his hand on his ratchet, pulls down his mask, and he goes, yo, man, I, finna, I, I, I love that record, but I was finna smoke you right now, homie. And the dude right next to me comes over. He goes, yo, can I get an autograph, man? He's like, yo, homie, I was finna smoke you too. You know, fucking Pookie didn't say nothing. I was finna smoke you, man, you know. And I'm like, who you want me to make the autograph out to? <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm like, so I'm like, oh fuck, yo, this shit is real. This shit is this shit is real, real. Needless to say, I'm the fuck out of there. I call Russell. I said, yo, this shit is real. This shit is real. This motherfucker put a hit out on us over some lyrics. I'm gonna fucking kill this motherfucker. The next day, we were giving away the Jeep on Greg Max, The Mac Attack, which was the morning show at K-Day. We walk in, and it's the day after the American Music Awards, and we walk into Greg Mack, and we're all excited, and Greg Mack is shaking our hands, and we're all happy dappy, and you know, excited to be on the morning show in LA, and yada, da da da. Cracks the mic, turns it on, K-Day, you know, da 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 AM, you know, Third base is here, probably the environment release album party tomorrow at the palace. And, you know, we're giving away that the third base Jeep. Uh, but we got a special person on the phone right now. Five of music, American Music Awards last night. He's up. He stayed up on our behalf. MC Hammer's on the phone. Hammer, how you doing? Hey, Greg, man, I'm great. Yo, it's great to talk to you. Yada, da, 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 da. He goes, yo, I heard you had something you wanted to say to uh, third base. He's like, well, you know, I just, I just want to tell him, you know, I don't think it's cool for somebody to, you know, diss their mom in a record. Like, you know, I don't think that's cool. Now, mind you, I never said that lyric. Pete said the lyric, right? So I look over to Pete. Your rhyme, dude. Say something. Nothing. Hmm. So I'm like, I right, fuck it. So I, so I say, you know what? I said, man, if, I said, if, if you feel like we dissed your matriarchal, that's okay. But you know what you did. You know what's going on in these streets. Why don't you man up and see me face to face so we can figure this out? Stop being a bitch. He takes a call live. Greg Mack, who's this? Rolling 60 Crip N-word. We finna kill them. Boop! Ah! Ow! <laughs> Security grabs us. We run out the fucking building. We get into the van. We start heading down the, the, the hill. There's two blue cars. And these dudes get out, Mac 11s, pointing at the fucking vehicle. Pookie jumps out, <laughs> throws his signs up. They get back in. They leave.
So now the big issue is, well, we got to give this Jeep away, which is now not happening. They'll figure that out. But we got to go to our party because not only are we doing this album release party, but Channel uh, Fox 5 is shooting it for the show The Reporters. You know, it's a big release, yada, da 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 And when we went to soundcheck, the entire palace, which is next across the street from the Capitol building, you know, is circled, circled by blue vehicles. Because Rolling 60, the Rolling 60 got like 50,000 members. So they can't get to everybody. And we can't not show. Like, it's not going to happen. Big D is with my conception the whole time. He's standing next to him. He goes to a recording session for We're All in the Same Gang. Hammer's there. Hammer and Mike have words. I don't know what was said. I heard it was something to the effect of Hammer asking Mike, why weren't they dead yet? And he says it in front of Big D. Whatever. And again, I can't, I don't know if it's true or not true, but this is what I was told. Mike tells him to go into the studio, don't worry about it, go into the, you know, the, the session, do what he has to do. And they figure out that the only way to protect us to get into the palace that night is we have to go in as security. So we're in Kevlar, ACA, I think it was ACS Security was the name of the, the security company. We got the jackets, we got the hats, we got dark glasses. I'm saying goodbye to my girl. She's crying at the Hyatt because they, you know, they want to make sure we get in first and yada, yada, yada. So we're, we're in a dark van and we see nothing but dudes just circling the venue. We get into the venue. Anyone, if you had blue socks, they told you to leave the building. There was an interview with All Hip Hop from like nine years ago or something where they asked him about that and he completely denied it. He said it was all nonsense. It's ironic that even today, 20-something years later, you know, uh, the search cat, he wanted his claim to fame to be, I'm telling you, Hammer was going to have me, you know, put in the dirt somewhere. That's ridiculous. I mean, that's ridic it's ridiculous that you want that to be your claim to fame. But when you only sold about 300,000 records, you got to grab something. You know what I'm saying? So the only conversation that man could ever have with me is to say, man, you know you was going to do something to me one time. But other than that, you can't even speak to me because... 300,000 records, you know, even now, you still ain't with wood today. You ain't, you, you undergo, so the only thing I can say is wood. Even 20 years later, you really can't address me. I'm, I'm saying the only thing, I, the conversation we have is because he can come in and talk to you as you're going to do an interview. But, you know, relatively speaking, man, my, my groups that I created sold more records than him. All of them, three, five, seven. You know, my group sold more records. Angie B sold more records than that cat. I mean, he's not relevant in a conversation with me. And it's the only time that I addressed it. And really the only time I'm going to address it. It was ridiculous. I didn't know who that dude was. You put your foot in your mouth, said a couple things. You let the smooth taste fool you. You thought the running man was more than a dance. Whatever it was. And I addressed it the way I always address it when any and everybody historically. Not nothing. Just addressed it and kept it moving. That's all. There's no statute of limitation on attempted murder. So he'll never, he, and he should never should. He never should. But my biggest issue to this day is I can't get over it. Because I would love to get to a place in my life where I could just give him a pound and be like, it's in the past. Like, understand, like, and have an understanding. Like, yo, it was just a witty rhyme. Your name of your album was Turn This Mother's turned this mother out. The out. Our album was The Cactus. The Cactus turned Hammer's mother out. It was, it was a dope line. I'm good. I'm not good. I've gone through 25 years of therapy three days a week. I am not good. I wish I could be good. But when somebody tries to kill you over a rap lyric, when I see these things where he's like, ah, man, you know, I had, you know, Oaktown 357 sold more records than third base and so that... I just want to like put a gun in his mouth. You know what I mean? Like, like, but, but that's me. Like, that's my anger. That has nothing to do with him. That's like me taking poison and waiting for him to die. That's my poison that I have to deal with, that I have to live with. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, I know Hammer. Uh, I've done interviews with him before. Uh, not directly with him, but we've been in the same. No, I know. You know, same radio stations and everything else like that. 
you never know how things ultimately will work out in the future. People grow up, people mature. And, that, and ultimately, nothing happened. Nobody actually got hurt. So I could see at one point something actually coming, you know, with the two of you, where you might actually be able to shake hands. And no, and and I and I sh- and I should be able to. I remember the last Yo MTV raps. Ed Lover was nice enough, and Ted Demi, may he rest in peace called me or like, yo, you know, you should come down here, be part of the freestyle and all of that. So I came down there and I was working with a group at, uh, called Nonfiction at the time. So I had like 20 goons with me, like Necro and Ill Bill. Like I had like mad goons with me. And uh, I got to do my little freestyle. And towards the end, Ed says to me, he's like, yo, you know, Hammer's here. Let's just, yo, it would be perfect. The end of Yo! MTV raps, you and Hammer just make peace. And I look at Ed and I was like, yo, Hammer's here? And I just went, ooh, ooh! And all my boys pulled their ratchets. Because we were all carrying. I, I just wanted to find them. And we couldn't, we couldn't find them. But that's where my head was in 1994. Feel it, just feel it a little bit, what you put me and my, and my, my wife through. Just, just feel it for 15 seconds. Understand what it feels like to not know that you can't turn a corner without somebody wanting to kill you for $50,000. Just so we're clear, it's not on him, it's on me. I have to make peace with it. I'm sure he's made peace with it a million times over. I'm sure he doesn't even think about it. I'm sure it's not even a thought and that's what it should be. I should mature. It's not him, it's me. I should mature, I should get to a place where I'm okay with it. I'm still not okay with it. And I'll work it out. I'll go to therapy for the rest of my life and work it out. <laughs> it's, it's me eating poison waiting for him to die. You know what I'm saying? Like that, it, and it's terrible. And it's destructive. And it's negative. And I know it's something that I have to move past. Um, and it's not his fault. Because I think if somebody would have dissed my mom, and I wouldn't have gotten to the bottom of it, I would have been angry. But I would have dissed them lyrically on a record. I wouldn't have put a hit out on them because I'm an MC. So you guys drop your second album, Derelicts of Dialect. Mm-hmm. Pop Goes the Weasel was on that record. Were you guys uh, dis Vanilla Ice? Did you guys ever run into Vanilla Ice after that record came out? No. Okay. And that was essentially your, your biggest record, Pop Goes the Weasel? Yeah. 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 Number two pop record. Yeah. Yep. Yes. You know, you guys sample uh, Sledgehammer, mm-hmm. which was a huge hit. Yep. Then you, then the group breaks up. Correct. You, you go your separate ways. Correct. Uh, Pete Nice and uh, and uh, Daddy, Daddy Rich f- mm-hmm. uh, form their own group. Correct. So, so you come out with your solo album, mm-hmm. and you know, I, I remember buying that album, and there was a song "Back to the Grill" again which featured this young kid named Nas. Now, I guess Nas was already on Live at the Barbecue at this point? Correct. But this was still like a very underground, you know, this guy did not have his own album yet. He was a very New York underground kind of artist. He, he, shows, he shows up on your, on your album. And was that, was that the line, uh, uh, pointing automatic guns at nuns? Was that, that was on yours? Yes. This is Nas, because you know how it runs. I'm pointing automatic guns at nuns, sticking up the preacher. In a church, I'm a stone crook, still a real killer that works by the phone book. Right. Few, I got a lot in shooting songs to hear. My rhymes are hotter than a prostitute with gonorrhea. Right. Stand out on that song completely. Without question, bodied all of us. Like there was no, there was no, there was, bodied all of us. Bodied all of us. But what people don't, Again, first of all, Main Source, Breaking Adams, top five greatest rap album of all time. Period. Every song, Snake Eyes. I don't listen, Vlad. I see you shaking your head. I don't care if you agree or not. No, For I'm me, not, I'm not shaking. This is me. This is. I'm just talking. This is me. This is my personal opinion. Me. You yeah. can agree or disagree. Looking out the front door, when P says we fight every night, well, that's not kosher. I reminisce with bliss of when we was closer. I'm done. I'm done. 
he used kosher in a rhyme. I'm, I'm Jewish and I'm like, why the fuck didn't I think of that? <laughs> but when Live at the Barbecue comes on and there's this young man that no one's ever heard of that says, streets disciple, my rap's a trifle. I shoot slugs from my brain just like a rifle. Stampede the stage. I leave the microphone. The phone, um, leave the microphone split. Play pretty toughy while I'm on some pretty tone shit. Verbal assassin, my architect pleases. When I was 12, I went to hell for snuffing Jesus. Nasty Nas is a rebel to America. Police murderer, I'm causing hysteria. My troops roll up with a strange force. I was locked in a cage and let out by the main source. Swimming and women like lifeguard, put on a bulletproof. I strike hard, kidnap the president's wife without a plan. And hang it like the Ku Klux Klan. I melt mics till the sound waves over. Before stepping to me, you'd rather step to Jehovah. Verbal, it's, it, that rhyme. So when, you know, we were talking about, thought I was a donut, you tried to glaze me. That verse was that line times 20. Because that was the other record in 1991 where everybody, well, I'm sorry. Yeah, 91. Where everybody was like, Pfft. Rhyme book's gone. Whoever this kid is, he's next up. Period. Whoever he is. Fatal is merciful. Then Fatal. Then Akinelli. Like, Paul had his clip. And everybody was like, whoever those dudes are, they're next up. Period. End of conversation. But no one knew where this kid Nas was. I had met him twice between 91 and 94 because he hung out a lot with G-Rap and G-Rap was my man because G-Rap and I were trying to work on a deal for a kid that he was working on called White Boy. Um, he had an MC named White Boy that was also from Corona. Um, and I would see Nas every now and then, but, but Nas was this quiet little dude and I never connected that that was the Nas from Live at the Barbecue until I saw him at a club called The Vault AKA Mars, and when he got on stage, first of all, there were like 50 shorties with him on stage, and the crowd went ape shit. And when I tried to get over to him, I couldn't, because there was just like a thousand goons around him. So yeah, so he was that dude, period. He was that dude. And I was working on my solo album, and Stretch uh, Armstrong and Daddy Reef came to the studio to check me in out. I was, I was with Red Hot Love Atone and Chub Rock, and they brought Percy P, they brought the Riddler, they brought Akinelli, and they brought Nasir. They all came to the studio. Um, and we were all chilling, hanging out, and I told Percy P, and I told the Riddler, and I told Ak, like, yo, if you wanna jump on, jump on, like, you know, whatever you wanna do, whatever, whatever. And Nas kinda just chilled, he just played the background, which was cool, like I wasn't, you know, wasn't stressing him, vice versa. It's like four o'clock in the morning, everybody mashes out, and Nas is still here. And I'm like, yo, you know, what's good? He's like, yo, can I, can I talk to you for a minute? I was like, yeah, of course. He's like, yo, um, Reef and Stretch offered me this deal on Big Beat. My lawyer's telling me to sign it, but I feel kind of funny about it. Would you mind taking a look at it for me? Tell me what you think. And I had already signed OC, and I had him, you know, I was, I was getting him set up because Fudge Pudge was another beast of a record. And I said, well, I can't do that because you're not signed to me. I can't legally look at any of your documents. Your lawyer loses mine. The only way I can look at it is if you're signed to my production company. I said, however, I'll make the deal really simple so it's not like you're signed to me forever. We'll just do a temporary 60-day deal so that I can look at the deal and I can represent you and then we'll figure it out. He's like, all right, let me think about it. I was like, cool, no worries. You know, I said, we're here tomorrow. You know, we're going to be working on this song. If you want to jump on it, great. If not, you know, all good. And uh, he gives me a pound, he leaves. I didn't expect him to come back. Uh, but sure enough, next day he comes back at like midnight. He puts like three or four blunts on the table at Chung King. Um, we start pulling. And... Um, at the end of the night, he's like, I, you know, send the, the contract to my lawyer, I'll sign it, and then I want you to go see, you know, stretch and reef and see what you can do about it. He goes, because I want the deal, but the deal feels fun, kind of funny, funny to me. So I sent it over to his attorney. Within 15 minutes, I get a fax back. <laughs> fax. Fax back that he signed it. So the first thing I do is I go to Russell. 
and Russell's with Tracy Waples at the time, and they're in, they're in his crib, and I play the demo, which is halftime, it ain't hard to tell, and I'm a villain. I play for Russ, and Russ and Tracy, and Russell says, just knee-jerk, eh, he sounds like G-Rap, and G-Rap don't sell no records, I'm not interested. I was like, cool, <laughs> out. <laughs> I'm not negotiating with you. you, good, you just gave me the pass. I gave you respect because you signed me, I was loyal to you, you said no, I'm out. I go to Stretch and I go to uh, Reef and I said, hey, I said, fellas, I said, look, your family, I'm not trying to fuck with y'all, but I, I saw the deal you offered them. It ain't, it ain't right. I said, this ain't 1988. You know, we can't offer the greatest MC of all time a deal like this. I don't want him to go anywhere. I just want you to make the deal better. Just make the deal better. And Reef and Stretch, you know, they were put in a very uncomfortable position. So they're like, come on, man, don't do this. Like, you know, the deal was already done. I was like, yeah, and I understand that. And I said, trust me, I'm not trying to hurt anybody here. I'm just telling you the deal ain't right. And you can't sign this kid. It's not right. It's just, it's not right. And again, like, you need to talk to Craig Kalman, who is the head of Big Beat. He needs to make the deal right. That's all I'm saying. So we talked for six, six hours back and forth. And they played hardball. And Reef came down and he's like, he's like, yeah, Craig said that's the deal, take it or leave it. I was like, ping, <laughs> out, bye. Go across the street to Black Rock. I go see Faith Newman, who had worked on the third base stuff when she was at Def Jam. And all I said to Faith was, um, I signed Nas. And she said, I'll be right back. And she left the room, and I sat there for like two hours. She comes back, and her boss at the time was this guy, David Kahn. And she was like, you're not leaving the building until we have a deal for Nas. So I said, fine. How many points does Billy Joel have? And that was our starting point, and that's how I negotiated the deal. They gave him uh, probably the fairest deal I've ever negotiated, ever in my career. Um... I then went to Zamba, same day. Already had this deal, which was very fair. High, high points, low risk for them because we didn't take a lot of money to, to make the album. Nice size bonus for him. Nice size, it was signing advance, so it wasn't recoupable against his album. Really high points. Points, really high points. Went to Zamba. I said, I got this kid Nas. This is what the album looks like. This is what his shares are going to be. They said, how much do you want? So I said, fine, this is what I want. And they said, well, how much of the publishing you own? I said, I don't own any of it. I just want a 5% admin fee. I'm not going to take a publishing deal. Done. I go to Nas. I go to his mom's apartment. And I handed him two checks. I said, we're done. Right? He, so he's like, you know, he moved his mom out. But the thing that people don't understand is with a production deal, and I'm not going to get too deep in the weeds, but with a production deal, just because you have a guy signed to your production deal doesn't mean that you can just sign him over to the label as you. There's a contract called an at-will agreement, which means that the artist has to agree to the at-will. Regardless if the points are amazing, it still means the at-will attaches you and then the points are assigned to you. So his attorney sat me down with my attorney and said, Nas appreciates everything you did, but we're not going to sign the at will. We want to sign directly to the label. And my lawyer starts talking. I said, don't talk. I got up. I went to Nas and I said, I wish you the best of luck. And I left. Because I knew he couldn't sign that deal at Sony. He couldn't. Because they couldn't bypass me. And what I was asking for was extremely fair. Extremely fair. Way less than Puffy got for Big. Way less than, than Dre got for Snoop. Way less than Baby got for Wayne. Way, because for me, Vlad, I couldn't be the Jew benefiting from the black man in front of me. I wasn't going to be that guy. I wasn't going to be Ahmed Erdogan and Aretha Franklin. I wasn't going to be Lior and Russell and every act that they signed. Like, I couldn't be that guy. No matter how much I could have benefited, I couldn't sleep with myself at night. So I wanted him to win. 
I'll be fine. I'll figure myself out. Um, and sure enough, an hour later, they were like, yeah, we'll sign. Not a problem. So he signed. Um, and, you know, the, re I, the rest is history. But, you know, what people don't realize is that Nas's first week of sales, he sold 165,000 albums April 20th. That, that week, he became a millionaire. He was already unrecouped. I mean, he was already recouped, excuse me. He became a millionaire the first week. And everything after that only made his wealth grow more and more. Well, later on, when Jay and Nas started going at it, uh, the takeover comes out by Jay-Z. Searchlight Publishing. Right, where, where Jay-Z basically says, I... You were getting fucked, well, and I know who I paid God, Searchlight Publishing, yeah. Right. So your name got thrown into what we could say, you know, one of the top, you know, top three greatest battles of all time. Definitely top, definitely top three. I would say top two, but definitely, yes. Yeah. 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 Yep. Um, yeah. So here's the thing about that, and this is a really quick story. I was the national director of crossover promotion for Def Jam. I was working Jay-Z's records with Dame Dash. They came to me and they said, hey, we need to clear the sample for Dead President. Can you give us like a fair deal? I said, well, the publishing is the publishing. I said, but yeah, I mean, you're my man. Like, you know, cut a check for $2,000. We'll, we'll clear the sample. No problem. Done. He's like, you'll have a check in 20 minutes. Fine. Called Zamba. I said, hey, we're still going to take 25% of the publishing on this record. Now it's going to get 25% because 25% of the record is Nas is, is shit, but they're going to give us $2,000. That's it. That's the whole story. I took a small advance, but I made sure Nas got 25%. So Jay can say whatever he wants. Jay doesn't own any Nas publishing, but Nas owns Jay publishing. So he mm. can say whatever he wants on an Ether record to kind of make Nas and get under Nas skin, but Nas even knows the truth because Nas, after that, on three other records, gave me, showed me love for, you know, for helping his career. So you don't own any of Nas's publishing? No. All I do is administrate it. And I don't even, and, and to be totally transparent, I don't even do that. Like between Anthony and his team, they do 99.9% .9 of it. I get a letter that says, hey, this is coming out. I'm like, great, ping. The Hennessy thing, I never saw a check. This, I never saw a check. Now, I get an admin fee. And again, I don't want to get deep in the weeds. You know, people are watching this because they want stories. They don't want to know about the fucking music business. But mm -hmm. the bottom line is I get an admin. I don't own any of his publishing. Administrative means that I just get a statement every six months that says, oh, this got used. Oh, this got used. Oh, are you aware that this person sampled this? No, go after it. Oh, are you aware that in Italy they use it ain't hard to tell? No, go after it. He owns all his publishing, always has. Dope. And I guess you executive produced his second album. It was Correct. But, it, that, but the difference was on the second album, he and I had an agreement that I was going to walk away on the second album. That he, he and I, we were already, it was already situated. We had a, a parting of the ways agreement way beforehand. He was going to pay me a certain amount of money and that he was going to start Ill Will Records and that was going to start on his second album. And his points were going to shoot way up. Like way, way up. Right. I would still keep my executive producer points, but his but the problem was Donnie Einer and Tommy Matola didn't want me to get out of the picture. So now I'm in this situation where they want to extend my deal. And Nas, I can't I won't go I won't go against my word. So I said, Nas, I said, so I called Nas and I called his attorney. I said, look, the only way we're going to make this work. Nas, you have to tell them that you fucking hate me and that you're going to kill me. And I'm going to say the same thing. That I can't fucking work with you anymore. I fucking hate you. I'm going to fucking kill you. Get me out of this fucking deal. Right? All the attorneys knew my attorney. Everybody knew. Oh, we're so sorry. We'll make this work. We'll make this right. John Ingracia, who is the head of legal. At, well, no, no, no. Search. No problem. We'll make this right. We don't want you to worry about it. We'll deal with Nas. No problem. We'll honor the deal, no problem. Nas got like a ridiculous amount of points, a ridiculous advance, all of that. We had to sign 
separation agreement, like a divorce, like a separation agreement. They had security. We had to go up to Tommy's office, like 20, security. He and I are walking with cigars in our mouths, arm in arm, laughing. Nas and I, with our attorneys. And Tommy Mato looks at Donnie and goes, I think we just got hustled, guys. <laughs> Signed, done, walked away happy. That's what's up. That's what's up. Yeah. And I respect Nas to death for this. So Nas was supposed to give me a certain amount of money. The very last minute, he says, no, nah, I'm not going to give it to you. I want, a, I want a 30% reduction on the money. I said, why? He goes, because that's what I think you earned. I said, are you fucking kidding me? Really? You're going to reduce me 30%? He goes, yeah. He goes, I don't want to give you the whole amount. I think you earned this. I said, you know what? You're a fucking great businessman. It's fine. I said, just do me a favor. Never forget what I did for you. Just do me a favor. If, one thing. Just never forget what I did for you. Because I promise you, there's no one in the fucking industry who would ever do what I did for you. You are the greatest artist of all time. Everybody would try to claw on to every fucking penny. No problem. Got you. I respected the shit out of him for that. Because he was, he was just a great businessman. It wasn't even ego. It wasn't even like him trying to fuck me. He was just being a savvy, smart businessman. That's why, that's why this Queensbridge venture, that's why he's having the success he's having. That's why he's having the success as an entrepreneur. That's why he's going to be the first real billionaire in hip hop. Ring and Lyft. And, and he's just bri he's a brilliant, savvy businessman. And Anthony and everybody around him, he's got great people around him. Yeah. I mean, you know, Nas always gets mentioned in, in the top MC list. Every time. Every time. His beat selection, you know, I, I've been public about, you know, my criticisms about that. But I've never once said anything about his lyricism. Yeah. No, I, the Kennedy Center, the Philharmonic, the re, that, I mean, I was crying my eyes out when Rob Kenner and Sasha sent me from Mass Appeal sent me the advance of the live from the Kennedy Center the Illmatic and I'm listening to that 200 piece orchestra playing Memory Lane I was sitting there bawling my eyes out because I couldn't think of anyone more deserving. And I know Jay did it in, you know, in, in New York, and he did it years before with Reasonable Doubt, but I mean, obviously I'm more connected to Illmatic than that, but I mean, I was sitting there bawling my eyes out. You have this really crazy story with Bushwick Bill. Can you tell that story? Absolutely. Be a pleasure. So we're on tour with the Ghetto Boys. Third base is on tour with the Ghetto Boys. And I knew Bushwick from Bushwick. <laughs> like, like I, knew, I knew him from Brooklyn. So I was really happy for all of them. And, and me and Scarface became cool and Willie D and all of them. Because, you know, you get on the road, you become cool with people. And we're in Baton Rouge. And um, Bill says to me, hey, my baby mama lives in New Orleans. And Thursday night, they do this comedy hip-hop thing that I'm connected to at a, at a club called Peaches. And I, are you, do you want to roll? And I was like, yeah, of course. I said, yeah, I would love that. That'd be dope. He's like, yeah, we're going to, you know, I got a car coming for us. You can just hang out. I said, great. Awesome. So we get in the car, and it's, it's Bill and his brother. And we get in the car, and Bill must have been drinking or something because he's already kind of loose. And as we're driving, Bill and I, he starts telling me how much he respects me because he likes the fact that I am very much into religious beliefs and, you know, that I see as a power greater than myself and kept, kept referring to it as the most high and, you know, and using the G word, G dash D and all of that. And then out of nowhere, he gets really impassioned and he stands up on the seat and he starts prophesizing to me about, you know, the most high and all of this. And I'm distracted because Bill is literally standing in the seat that you should be sitting and his head isn't hitting the roof. And he's standing there like a preacher at a pulpit. 
And his brother is like, yes, yes, Bill, yes, yeah. And, and he was saying some powerful, powerful things, but I couldn't get over the fact that Bill was the height he was, that he could stand in a limo and his head not hit the roof. And I couldn't get past that. Our driver, mad cool dude, about to have his first kid. He had this big white cowboy hat that his wife had just bought him as a birthday gift. He was super proud of this hat. We pull into New Orleans. We pull into what I believe was his baby mama's house. And we pull up and these little dwarf kids in, in diapers start running out saying, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. And I'm trying to, I, I mean, you know, it's cute. It's cute, but it's mad obscure. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't even know Bill had kids. Especially not dwarf kids. And his girl comes out, and she's pregnant, and, you know, with Bill's next child. We go inside. And I meet Bill's baby mama's mom. And um, she's mad hard. Like, she's like ice grilling me the whole time. And when we came into the house, it was the kitchen. And I'm seeing like a triple beam over here and all of this. And she's sitting there and I look over in the corner. And there's some, let's just say artillery. So there was a bay window on this side. And I turned around the bay window and lined up underneath the bay window were these kilos of coke. So I turned to Bill and Bill turns to me, he goes, yeah, my baby mama's mom is the, she's the coke queen of New Orleans. I was like, yeah, can I go wait in the car? Is that cool with you? I need to get the fuck <laughs> up out of here. Um, he's like, yeah, man, no worries, you know, yada, 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 we're gonna go to Peaches in like five minutes. Cool. Baby mama gets in the car. And um, Bill's brother's going at the, the limo bar heavy, heavy, drinking brown, drinking white. I don't care. So, you know, we get to Peaches. Bill's lick it up. His brother's lick it up. His girl band is rocking. Co comedians are funny. We're dancing, having a good time. It's 4 o'clock in the morning. He and I get on. We start freestyling, having a blast. But our buses are taking off to go from... Uh, from Baton Rouge to Arkansas, they're leaving at 8 o'clock in the morning. And it's like an hour between New Orleans where we are, 90 minutes between that and Baton Rouge. And it's like 4 o'clock in the morning, right? So we can't find Bill's brother. And then I finally find him, and he's kicking it to these two girls. Whatever, do it. Do You do whatever you got to do, right? So I'm, I'm kind of telling Bill, like, yo, Bill, we got to get out of here, especially because we got to drop off your baby mama. And like, yo, you know, the bus is going to take off soon. All right, all right, yeah. We get in the, the limo. And as we get in the limo, Bill's brother goes, hey, Serge, yo, could you just like roll with me over to this Burger King? You know, these girls want to meet you and I'm, I'm going to roll out with them. But like one of the girls thinks you're really cute and yada, da, da, da. And I'm like... Yo, nah, he's like, yeah, 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 no worries. And he jumps in the car and he tells the girls, I'm going to meet you at Burger King. So we pull out and we get to the light and he's telling, and Bill's brother's telling Bill, like, yo, can you just drop me off at Burger King so I can meet these chicks, right? And Bill just, for some reason, starts spazzing out. Yo, don't tell me where to take my fucking limo. Yo, I ain't going nowhere. Fuck you talking about. Now, Bill's brother, even though he's lick it up, is simply just trying to tell him, yo, the, but the Burger King's like, right? We just have to make a right. It's right. Yo, don't fucking tell me where to go. Driver, you drive the fuck, da 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 this and that. And they're beefing. And now I'm trying to tell him, like, yo, the Burger King's right over there. Like, you know, stop the, stop the limo. Driver, pull over, pull over. Bill, pull over. They get out the limo, and Bill's brother is just pleading with him. And Bill is spazzing out on him. Yo, I brought you out here. I fed you, yada, yada, just beefing. And I look out the window, and I see the Burger King is right over there. So I get out of the limo, and I come around the back, because they're in the street beefing. 
As I come around, Bill says, fuck you, grabs a brick and throws it at his brother and hits him right in the head. And his brother starts leaking. His brother feels his head, looks at Bill, and then goes into some Jim Kelly Kung Fu shit. And Bill goes, and he starts running little legs. And he jumps into the limo, and his brother's leaking, right? So I'm like, oh, my God, I, I can figure this out. I'm just going to go to the Burger King. I'm going to run over to the Burger King, get these chicks in their car, get Bill's brother the fuck out of here. I can figure this out, right? As this is happening, Bill runs through the limo to the seats and tries to jump through the partition where the driver is. So he's doing, like, some escape hatch shit. Right? Bill's brother goes in there too. And his girl starts going, don't hurt my baby. Don't hurt my baby. And she goes to grab him. And Bill's brother pops her. And I'm like, yo, this, I got to get these chicks over here now. Like, I got to get him to fuck. He just hit some chick. Like, this shit is about to get heavy. I'm running over right i'm running over to burger king and it, and it's this dark parking lot mall strip mall it's empty and the lights ain't even on it's 4 30 in the morning i'm running running i see the promoter from peaches is now over there and i'm like okay cool maybe like he's there to like and i'm like yo 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 the girls get in the car and they drive off. And I'm like, ah, oh, fuck. So I start walking back. And Bill is pleading with his brother. Pleading with him. Please don't kill me. And I mean, his brother's leaking. His fate leaking. And I can hear him. Bill is sitting on the stoop. Pleading, like, please don't kill me, please don't kill me. His brother's threatening to kill him. His girl is crying. The promoter pulls up next to me. He's like, man, sir, you didn't want them hoes anyway. I was like, I didn't want them hoes in the first place. I had to get Bill's brother out of here, man. You just fucked everything up. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? Nah, I was doing y'all a favor. I'm like, trust me, hunt mo money, you ain't you didn't help nobody. Like, oh yeah, well, fuck you. I'm like, yeah, okay, fuck me. Get the fuck out of here, right? The second he says it, it pulls out, Bill's baby mama pulls next to me in like a fucking K car. Some like, right? And she goes, where's Bill's brother? And I'm exhausted at this point. So I go, and he's, and he's over by the limo. And she pulls out the AK and she's like, that motherfucker's dead. And she pulls off. And I'm like, oh, what the fuck? fuck is going on now he's pleading he's leaking the mom's in his fucking plymouth k car with an ak about to wet him up and the cops come the mom does a gone the second bill sees the police car he starts screaming on his brother fuck you throw him under the fucking Throw him under the jail. Throw that motherfucker under the jail. Yeah, I'm Bushwick Bill. Throw that motherfucker under the jail, right? So they lock, <laughs> lock up Bill's brother. And this is, th there's certain moments in your life that you see for the rest of your life. This is the one I see for the rest of my life. Bill's brother locked up in the back of a New Orleans police car. The window cracked. His brother leaking. And Bill jumping to the crack of the window to spit on his brother because he can't reach it. So he's jumping up just to spit on him to be like, fuck you. And he's wetting up the entire window with phlegm because he can't even reach the crack. We get in the car. We got his baby mama. We drop her off. Me and Bill are in the car. It's five o'clock in the morning. We're both exhausted. We're barely speaking. It's pitch dark. The car pulls over. The limousine driver pulls over. He pulls down the partition and points a 45 at us and says, 
One of you motherfuckers crushed my, my, the hat my wife bought me. Y'all owe me $450 for this hat. And either I'm going <laughs> to plug you or you're going to pay me. And I look at Bill and I go, I got this. Gave him the money. Went to Baton Rouge. Never saw Bill again. If you want to hear stories like this, as well as other stories, MC Search has a Kickstarter campaign right now. Yeah. You want to talk about that? Yeah. So, I mean, really quickly, I, I'll just do it really quickly. Um, you know, for years, people have always told me because of these stories, I should write a book. You know, um, I, am I going to put out new music? I did something with my homeboy DJ Menace in Dallas with The Addicts, a record called Belief, a couple of years ago. People really seem to gravitate towards it. So I always get these combinations about like, oh, when are you going to put out new music? And when are you going to write a book? And when are you going to, you know, it's, it's one of the other. And it's, you know, it's not millions of people, but it's certainly fans and hardcore fans. And I said, you know what? I have a period of time that literally where things shut down, for me at least, which is December, January. And my man, um, Temp3000 in Orlando said, yo, why don't you do a book slash album? Do an audio book slash album where you tell your stories, but at the end of each chapter, there's a, there's a, a record. I was like, huh, I don't think it's ever been done before. So we started like looking around. I, I spoke to my homeboy, Paul Rosenberg. I was talking to him about it. He's like, yo, that's a dope idea. Like that, That's just never been done. So I said, you know what? Let me do a Kickstarter, you know, with the idea of if I get, if I raise the money, great. If I don't, great. I'll figure it out, you know. But in this particular part of my life, in this particular time in my life, December and January, I have the time to do it. I write every day anyway. I write four to eight bars every day about something. I've certainly written lyric after lyric about these stories, whether it's about how I met Jam Master J or how I met... Uh, Pete or how Pete and I broke up or, you know, things that I have experienced. So I figured, you know what, it'd be a good idea for a book. So I called the, the book idea, Did I Ever Tell You the One About? Uh, it's a Kickstarter campaign. It just Kickstarter just called it, a, I think there's a special section called Things We Love. So it just became a, a highlighted part of that. Uh, they were really cool. I met with them yesterday. They're helping to push it. Chris Rock just did a really nice pose, Kamal Bell. You know, a lot of people have really taken to gravitating towards the idea of this. Questlove did a really lovely um, video in front of 80,000 people in Barcelona. You know, just so I think there's some interest there. So I was like, you know what, let me do a Kickstarter. You know, and then it's, it's, it's just been really nice, Vlad. Like my man Brian Fisher, Chef Brian in Chicago, He's going to like close his restaurant for one day in Chicago. We're going to do a Q&A. You know, I'm going to perform. We're going to have food. And, you know, so people are really stepping up trying to help, you know, raise money for this. It's just really, it's been amazing. And, and it's only been like a week, but it's been amazing, like, how people have been kind of coming out and saying, yo, we've been waiting for you to do this. So that's that's what I'm doing. So it's called, did, uh, did I ever tell you the one about? And it's a book slash album and uh, as you go up in different tiers we're going to be doing different things private performances here in the uk and and that's the idea and i'm excited about it i really am yeah me too man can't wait to uh to listen to it well you'll get a hardcover copy i'll actually make you read something mc search man Definitely an honor to finally get to do this. We've been talking about doing this for years and years. We finally made it happen. Yeah, I'm really glad. I'm really glad that we got to do it. Thank you, Vlad. And thank you for, you know, always keeping me in a conversation, you know, with Griff and with all the other people that, you, you know, you've talked about, about my career. And I really appreciate you keeping, you know, our name out there because you don't have to. And I appreciate it. Thank you, brother. No doubt, man. Next time we'll talk about all the stories that we missed in this interview. We definitely have to talk about the Griff story, too. So, yes, we will yeah, definitely talk we'll, about We'll that. definitely talk about the Griff story. Absolutely. MC Search, until next time. Salute. Peace.